Good morning. It's Good Friday and I have my photo album here and I'm looking back on some of the photographs from my trip to the Holy Land. It was 10 years ago now, but it has been just lovely to flick through the pages and just to reawaken the memories, to revisit the special places and just remind myself of the places we've been. The boat on the Sea of Galilee, floating in the Dead Sea. It's been just great to remember all those special times. But for me, one of the special things that we visited was the garden tomb. I don't know whether you've heard of that or whether you've visited there before, but the garden tomb is a garden in Jerusalem. It has an ancient uh, tomb in the garden. It's outside the city walls and it's near the Damascus Gate. And the garden tomb really came about. In the 1840s, there was a German theologian and he'd been reading in the Gospels about Jesus carrying his cross, being taken to the place of the skull for crucifixion. And as he was in Jerusalem, this theologian saw a rocky cliff that really resembled a skull and wondered, could this be the place where Jesus was crucified? And then he read that um, when Jesus was crucified, he was buried in a garden nearby. And there was this garden nearby. And he wondered, could this be the place where Jesus was crucified, where he was buried and from where he rose again? That idea was taken up by others over time and today the garden tomb is a place where anyone can visit. It's open to anyone. It's not like a tourist attraction. It's more a place where people come for to see the tomb. They come to uh, perhaps to encounter, to be quiet, to think, to reflect and it's a very special place for many who visit Jerusalem. Sometimes groups will go there and will have Holy Communion in the garden. The Garden Tomb organisation, Charity, they don't make any claims that this is definitely the place where Jesus was buried. But in a way, that doesn't matter quite so much. Because for those who visit, including me, that place is a wonderful place, can be a wonderful place of encounter with Jesus. Now, when I was looking through all the things that I had from that, those holidays years ago, what did I come across? But a video from being in the garden tomb. And it was a bit video where I was reading from the gospels, sitting in the garden tomb. You'll hear the birds in the background and I hope that just this little snippet that we're going to use might just give you a flavour of our visit to the garden tomb. Joseph of Arimathea, who had been a secret disciple of Jesus because he feared the Jewish leaders, asked Pilate for permission to take down Jesus' body. When Pilate gave permission, Joseph came and took the body away. With him came Nicodemus, the man who had come to Jesus at night. He brought about 75 pounds of perfumed ointment made from myrrh and aloes, following Jewish burial custom. They wrapped Jesus' body with the spices in long sheets of linen cloth. The place of crucifixion was near a garden, where there was a new tomb, never used before. And so, because it was the day of preparation for the Jewish Passover, and since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. On Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. 
Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there, while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For until then, they still hadn't understood the scriptures that said Jesus must rise from the dead. Today, Good Friday, is taking me back to that garden. This time it's in my imagination. And I'm thinking of that gloomy, dark afternoon when a small burial party, led ironically not by his disciples who were long gone, but by secret believers as they're described, by Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus who had come to ask Jesus questions in the past, men who were influential in Jewish circles, prominent in the Sanhedrin. It was they who stepped up and having asked Pilate for the body of Jesus, they had taken him down from the cross. No doubt still shaken by the horror and the brutality that they had witnessed that day. Shocked by the darkness that had descended on Jerusalem and by the shaking of the earth beneath their feet and carrying the tortured, broken body of their teacher and Lord to be laid in Joseph's own new tomb. Today is the day we think of the cross. Sometimes we sanitise our thoughts about the crucifixion. We don't really want to think about nails and crowns of thorns. We don't want to think of the brutality, the violence, the jeering, the cruelty, the hatred. Perhaps we just want to relegate those thoughts, those disturbing thoughts, to the back of our minds. But the cross, the symbol of death, has become for us a symbol of life new life. The cross, the cruel cross, offers us forgiveness. The cross, that cross of rejection, offers us belonging and acceptance. The cross, a place of grief, invites us into the arms of a loving Father and ushers us right into his presence. Today, just for a few moments, let's linger at the cross. Let's pause by the crucified one and kneel in worship. God bless you. Join with me now as we pray together. Lord God, the world wants us to rush, to dance to its tune, to meet its deadlines, but we need to pause. Not for self-indulgence or satisfaction, but to spend time with you. Let us pause at that rock on which our faith is founded and remember well all that you have done for us. Rejected by the religious, abandoned by the fearful, and abused by the cynics, our Saviour takes it all onto his shoulders. Our sins have been carried by him, a load that we cannot manage. He bears the sins of the world for us all. It is not the nails that hold him there, but his love which keeps him faithful to you day that is of pain and suffering, and yet a day that is good. Words of gratitude seem so inadequate, and yet we want to thank you, Lord God, for all that this day means. We mourn the sacrifice and 
yet celebrate the victory. Sin no longer has the final say. Our debts are paid and our redemption bought. So as Christ has given himself for us, may we learn to give ourselves for you. Let our faith be strengthened and our love deepened. May we give not just this moment of reflection, but our whole lives to you. May we know your love, listen to your voice, and commit our lives as we respond in love and adoration. For we pray this in the name of our crucified Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>